before we go on in today's episode, the book we'll be talking about is titled Evident Equity, A Guide for Creating System-Wide Change in Schools. This book provides a comprehensive way for leaders to demonstrate equity and integrate equity into every facet of their schools. Each chapter of the book covers a different aspect of equitable leadership, from organizing staff to benefit equity to staying strong in the face of inevitable adversity. We are joined by the author of this book, Lauren Mascareñas. She is a career educator who spent 10 years as an elementary classroom teacher and instructional coach in Denver, Colorado, as well as the Bay Area of California. Her passion for culturally responsive instruction also led her to Learning for Justice, which was formerly Teaching Tolerance, a project for Southern Poverty Law Center, where she also served as teaching and learning specialist. Most recently, though, she was the Director of Equity Affairs for Wake County Public Schools in Raleigh, North Carolina. That's just such an incredible amount of experience and exposure of different areas of what we're going to talk and cover today about equity. Um, Lauren, thank you so much for joining me for this episode. Thank you so much. It's so good to be here. I appreciate the time and the audience. Thank you. This is such a a valuable time that we get to have with you, the actual author of this book. Um, So we do want to get into just questions about you before we get into the book. Um, Can you share with us about your current role in education? Sure. So yeah, I've been in a lot of different positions in education, um, which has been amazing to get to see education from so many different sides. Um, currently, I have started consulting on my own. I work I, um, with schools all over the country, educational organizations on systemic equity um, and how to implement kind of this broad scope idea of how we um, approach diversity, equity, and inclusion work. And so I've had the opportunity to work with just some really amazing schools and organizations organizations that are doing some pretty cool stuff and ready to make change. And so I'm doing that full time now. That's good. Um, So tell us more about um, what you saw as an educator. Um, That's amazing that you were an educator for so long. Um, And you can still continue to do that um, in consulting. But while you were an educator, what did you see that further encouraged you to become a consultant uh, for equity? That's a great, uh, another great question. So I think that, you know, as we um, have the privilege of being in classrooms and spending our whole day with students, um, we can't help but see the um, opportunity gaps and the funding gaps and um, the the state of education, especially in the United States and what is happening. And so um, in the schools that I was lucky enough to work in, um, I was able to see a pretty deep divide between what my students were being offered as an education or as a building um, for education, even just the structural facilities of where my students were going to school. And um, it really radicalizes you when you spend time in spaces where um, you're experiencing, you know, exactly what your students are experiencing too. And so I felt very strongly that um, my students deserve the best education, even though they were in a zip code that maybe was not getting the amount of tax money that other zip codes were. And it really spurred to action um, this like very deep rooted belief that I don't un- you know, this doesn't make sense. I, I need to do something different. Um, and so I I love being in the classroom. I miss being in the classroom every single day. Um, but this kind of journey that I've been on about just kind of saying yes to different opportunities that have um, allowed me to serve education in multiple different aspects has kind of led me to this belief that, you know, we can work for the system. I worked for a large system. I worked for a large nonprofit, large school districts. Um, We can work in those spaces, but when we do equity work and diversity, equity, inclusion work, it's very difficult to do that work from the inside out. Um, And so I created this book and this, you know, space to be able to kind of say, I've done this work in different spaces and how do I help others kind of create change and especially determine the ripeness of being able to make change. And so, um, I think, you know, as all of our career decisions, you know, they're personal decisions. I'm a mom. I was living very far away. I'm a single parent. I was living very far away from family. And 
um, had spent most of my son's life away and said, let me, let me move back close to family. And then let's also see how I can, you know, kind of strategically use all these amazing experiences I've been given to help others. And so I think that, um, the, the deep divides I saw as an educator, plus kind of seeing how different organizations are working at it from different ways, kind of caused me to think, you know, lots of people are doing this work, but I'm not sure we're really talking about the root of the issue, right? We can't really add this work on top of things. We have to really go back and change the system. And I wasn't seeing places that were really trying to disrupt systems in that way. And so that led me to just a passion to keep researching, keep learning, keep talking to people about what they were doing to really disrupt the system of inequity that's happening in education. I like that word disrupt, but it's it's constructive though, the way that your book is so set up to, um, yes, let's talk about the reality of this, but then also um, let's make action, let's implement, um, let's make like let's make positive change. Um, it has that, uh, it's soul of the book. I really like about, about the book. Um, so in your book, you do describe, uh, advocates for culturally responsive teaching and learning that influenced you to observe the significance for equity in the classrooms and communities. Can you tell us more about that? Sure. Um, oh, I've been so lucky to meet so many amazing people on this journey. I think my students were my greatest teacher, right? My students were my best teacher and my best um, advocates for themselves and for what their um, world should look like and what their education should look like. And so they were um, the best advocates and the best teachers in this work. And I love getting all of their graduation photos and their cards and being friends with them on Instagram now that they're grown people and being able to see how um, their lives have continued to move and flow. And I think that um, number one, them. And then I think that the advocates that I worked with in San Francisco and in Oakland um, were really big early proponents of what culturally responsive teaching looked like. And I was fortunate enough to go to, um, I had a principal, um, Ms. Rice Mitchell, who had all of us go to culturally responsive teaching training. And we went to go see Dr. Sharaki Holly and learn about different protocols and how to really engage our students. And um, her work and the that kind of encouraged me a lot. Oh, I like this. I love how this happens. You know, sitting in a professional development all day and not sitting all day or not just watching slides happen all day, but really learning the way that we hope to teach. And that's what I hope to do. And so that was my first experience with that in education. And so I took that and ran deep with it and met um, at the Southern Poverty Law Center, just this incredible cadre of people who are just social justice just deep into so much more knowledge and so much more community activism than I could have ever dreamed of um, and really taught me the roots of, you know, our, our movement and um, what is happening in the United States. And so I think the people that I work with along the way keep us afloat, right? And these advocates for the work because it's hard. DEI work is very, very difficult. And especially if you're on your own, and I try to address that in the book is kind of like this idea of how you build your coalition around you, like who are the people around you that um, kind of buoy you, you know, hold you afloat in these in these times, especially now when we're seeing um, so much vitriol and so much prejudice and so much hate. How do we keep people around us who surround, you know, who can fight the good fight with us, but also take care of us? And when I was um, director of equity affairs in Wake County, I was so fortunate to work with just the most incredible equity advocates who were doing the work with me. And if I hadn't have had that group of people around me to say, no, you know, no, you're not being gaslit. This is, you know, this is, this is real, like, right, this is really a problem or I'm seeing it the same way or what can we do? And just to process and talk and really like, like flesh those things out together there's no way I would have <laughs> lasted. And so um, that coalition of advocates and people around you that teach you and show you different things. Um, yeah, that's why I'm able to do the work that I do is because of all of them. It also um, showcases, kind of reassures perhaps that you're not alone and that um, a lot of this is very necessary. Um, it could be that some teachers or, or leadership might Feel like it's not something that's attainable if they don't have that sense of support. 
Um, so looking closer at the book, um, can you give us kind of like an overview of what equity is? I know we've been talking about the word for a minute now, but uh, just to be more grounded in, in relation to the classroom, schools, and then districts. Sure, absolutely. I think that you could ask a dozen people what equity means and it, that you would get a dozen different responses. Um, equity, as I define it in the book, is, is not only this um, how we encourage everyone to succeed in their own way. And, um, you know, a lot of people kind of see that cartoon of the kids standing on different boxes, which to me is not, is not the definition of equity, but I think a lot of people's brains go there. You know, it's this idea of um, everybody needs something different. And so how do we, you know, do more? And a lot of people say like, oh, it's kind of like differentiation in the classroom or different things like that. But when I'm talking about equity, I'm really talking about eliminating the access and the barriers for historically marginalized groups in order for them to succeed at the same level as their, you know, their white and Asian or, you know, affluent counterparts are. And so it's really about this removal of barriers, about increasing access, increasing opportunities, um, and really leveling that playing field in sort of a way. And so we have, in order to level the playing field, we have to really fiercely advocate and lift up our groups that have been historically oppressed. Um, and I know that, you know, it's, it's a difficult conversation and, and it um, leads to oftentimes, you know, many sensitive subjects for people, but um, that is the essence of equity. And when I'm talking about it, I want to make sure that whoever a student is when they walk into a, a school or whoever a, a staff employee is when they walk into a space that they are included, that they belong, that they see themselves there, that they know that they can bring their full authentic self into that space and that they don't have to necessarily jump hurdles or obstacles in order to succeed just because of who they are. That's so good that you mentioned that. Like I was so focused on like this book being for the educators or like the teachers um, to implement for their students, but I didn't also put it together that it, this is also meant for those educators that can also have been, that have also been placed um, in a box per se. Yeah, um, absolutely. Um, because teachers and staff and principal and, and I use the word educators, right? That's anyone who's supporting students, whether at the district office or our custodians, our incredible food and nutrition staff. They also have to feel as though they can bring their full authentic selves and um, whoever they are in the language they speak and the culture that they come from or who they choose to love. That's their gender expression. Everything should be welcome in that space, and especially in a public school setting, right, which is majority of the time that I've spent in public schools. And um, certainly the incredible private schools I've worked with have done a lot of that work, too. And so I think um, yeah, we forget about the adults too, but if your adult doesn't feel like they can be themselves in that space, well, then we know for sure students aren't feeling like that. Yes. Um, so in this book, you mentioned that um, you once heard an educator note that we can't talk about equity in schools until we talk about how schools were never meant to be equitable in the first place. Wow, that that whole sentence, I like kept reading it. I was like, I, it made sense to me, obviously. Yes, it was. I was like, this is so deep, but, but like, oh, this is so good. Why, why um, was this thought provoking? So I think, oh, and I wish I, I, I'm sure if I scrolled way back in my Twitter timeline, I'd be able to see, you know, who I liked it. It was, it was an educator that I follow on Twitter. So shout out to who that was. And I don't want to co-op your idea, but this idea that, um, you know, we, we talk about diversity work and equity work and, you know, kind of leveling the playing field, but we, that's, that, those are symptoms. We have to go back to the root. The root is that education was not meant for everybody to begin with. In the book, I kind of give this like brief little, like, you know, snippet about, you know, from the original or, or origins of our country, it was not made for everybody, right? It was for an affluent white, you know, land owning group of people, which is, not the populace that we have then or now. And so when we start talking about all the laws that have been put into place, legislation, policy, funding decisions that have created the education system we have now, our education system is built on a system of inequity. It's literally created that way. It's made to operate the way that it is. 
And so when we kind of try to add things on top of it, oh, here's, here's a class, here's a training, here's this, we're just adding more on top of a system that is already inequitable. And so if we're going to talk about it, we have to, or if we're going to try to change it, we at least have to address the fact that it was inequitable to begin with. Let's at least just say that out loud. Okay, this wasn't built for everyone. This doesn't work for everyone. It wasn't made with people like me in mind, with people like my, you know, my son, like our my students. It was not made with them in mind. And so we have to um, really go to a place where we say, okay, let's let's talk about the elephant in the room. This was not made for everybody. Now, what do we do? Um, kind of like saying you have a problem is the first step and, you know, saying that you have a problem is it's really admitting it, right? We really have something here that is, um, let's all be honest about who it was made for and who it was not made for. And then we can move on from there. Moving forward um, together, and it's not to um, put any fault or put anybody in a, in a guilt situation. It's more like, like you said, like, let's clarify, um, like any foundation that is implemented, like like construction, they put a, a good foundation, a solid foundation, so that that, that building doesn't tumble over. Um, same thing, like if we just address everything that is in history, um, to why it's how it is now, then we can move forward, but together in a unified way. The house is built on a shaky foundation. You don't want to keep adding bricks to it. You want to to redo the foundation. Absolutely. No, I love that analogy. That's what I keep trying to tell people. We don't, don't add more, don't add more teams, don't add more books, don't add more things. Let's, let's change what you've got. And that's really where, yeah, the idea and the, the, um, you know, the framework for this book came from. Absolutely. I love that analogy. I'm going to take, take that. Yeah, you should. <laughs> uh, so there is this section that focuses, like you were t- talking about earlier, um, that focuses about building coalitions um, to enable equity. Why is this useful? And then how does, do you start one? Because you did talk about like you had your own, but like how can somebody start one who's listening? Yeah, absolutely. So I think that there's a lot of, certainly a lot of different ways to do this, but I think that the more avenues we have open for equity work, the better. We know that people come to equity work in a lot of different ways. Um, Some people may want to be a part of a book study. Some people may want to be a part of a conversation. Some people may watch a movie. Some people will try some, a new instructional practice in their classroom. So the more opportunities that we offer, um, the more we allow people to really be in that space with us and really see who is a part of our coalition. So when I was in Wake County, yes, I was in the equity office, but I was also going to, you know, um, groups that were putting on movies for the weekend and, you know, screenings and let's watch this or, you know, going to different um, schools or different events. And that's the space where I really found like my people, right? Like my coalition. But I also think being very strategic about you know, we give a lot of attention and time to kind of the naysayers or the people who are like, this isn't going to work. I don't have time for this. Or, this doesn't belong in education. And when we give a lot of voice and time to them, we neglect to see all the people that are actually with us or could be with us because we're giving so much attention. And so I have, you know, this very scientific, you know, graph and everything is like rooted in this um, activism research and and, um, and rooted in, you know, this idea of how we move and change people over, you know, course of movements and unions and organizing, but it really comes down to how do we um, build up and increase the capacity of the, those around us and those who are very close to being, you know, in the group with us and not spending the time and energy on like kind of our you know, see people if you look at a charter graph or kind of the people who are, you know, spending a lot of time and in every workplace and every school, there's always this group of people who are like, no, that's not the thing. We can't spend time there. And we just give them so much attention. And anytime I'm talking to schools or people, I'm like, let it go, let them go. They're not your people. And as soon as I say that, it's almost like people have this like weight off of them. Like what? I don't have to get everybody with me. It's like, no, cause you'll never get everyone into your coalition. Right. But we can make it very uncomfortable for them and we can make the environment 
so inclusive and so um, equitable that they either get on with the coalition or they get off the ship, right? And so it's more about that positivity, that building, that um, relationships that you have with your people and the people that are close to you rather than kind of feeding, you know, the other side. So this book um, does provide strategies to take action, which um, is really great. Uh, how does this book serve as how it mentions um, as a reflective tool for change uh, to help educators create a system wide change for all students? So when I had the opportunity to write this book, I was thinking about, you know, all my years and um education and thinking about all the professional development that I, you know, was a part of or book studies that I was a part of and thinking about the books that I actually read and that I actually spent the time reading cover to cover and would go back and use. And they were um, ones that I wrote in. They were not huge, you know, thick, full of lots of theory and whatnot, that they were very actionable, that they were something I could turn to and go, oh, okay, let me do that right now. Um, or I could bookmark something. And I think that that was my vision for this. And the, the framework of kind of how do we move outside of teams really came from these conversations that I was having with organizations, with schools that were like, you know, we've had a team, a diversity, equity, inclusion team or an equity team for years, but nothing has changed. And I was like, okay, of course it hasn't changed, right? Because there's so much more to do. But I think, you know, in education, there's so much to do. There's so much on our plates that we just kind of get stuck. And it's like, let me, let me get a group of people together that can work on it. And so I started thinking about what are the other ways in which this really lives out in a school? And so that's where the framework really came from. And it became this idea of if someone wanted to pick up this book and say, you know what, we really need to do work on our systems and structures. They could just go to that chapter and say, here's some ideas. Here's how it's looked in real life. I want it. All of the examples in the book are straight from schools, straight from educators, straight from places that um, I've been fortunate enough to work. And so they're real, you know, and they're not just kind of like, in theory, one might be able to do this. It's like, no, this is what people actually have done. And I wanted it to be the space where people could, you know, kind of pick and choose. And, 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 and the idea is to move to this like more holistic approach, right? We can't throw a team at something and say things are going to change because that's exactly what we're doing. We're adding more bricks to the, to the, to the faulty foundation, right? And so we work at a school level or we work at a district level or a system level. And I think it, it clicks because it starts to think about the little mundane details or little mundane systems or structures that you have in place and really kind of go, oh, how can I ship that just a little bit? Like I talk about carpool signage, like this is a very basic idea, right? That people are like, that wouldn't be something that I need to deal with. But when you actually just look at something that simple signage, you know, this is not a sign that works. This is a sign, you know, oh, how could we change it to be more inclusive, more equitable? So those are the type of things I'm talking about when I say like, we can't add more, we have to change what we already have. And so talking about what norms you use in your, you know, PLC, what you do for your PTA, you know, just all those type of things that you're already doing. Don't add more. I keep telling people, don't add more, change what you have, you know, shift what you have and little tiny changes in lots of different places add up to really big change. And I think it becomes the idea of trying to shift the entire system of an equitable education system is big, right? And that's why I think a lot of people don't start because I understand it's huge. Where do I start? What do I do? I see my data. I see what's happening with my students, but where do I go? And I think it becomes decision paralysis and it just becomes what's easy, let's put together a team, let's read a book, let's do that. And those are fantastic ways to start. Mm -hmm. And what else we have to, you know, let's look at the foundation. And so some of the most high leverage things, and I put examples in there, are you looking at how you're making your class list, who gets into AP and honors classes? You know, how are we looking at our signage, looking at what's on the walls? I mean, there's, it's literally everything that you could pick up or grab or do in a school. And we can really shift that and not necessarily feel like we're having to take the whole education system onto our back at the same time. So environment, the environment of, oh, okay. Absolutely. Yeah. That's the, the chapter on evident equity is this idea that when you're in a space, you know, you know, who belongs there and who is welcome and who goes to school there. And 
Um, I think about things like murals in incredible schools that I've been to and what they look like. And, you know, who do we choose to paint on the walls? This is a school that I worked with that was, you know, majority white and Asian. And they're, um, they chose to make an incredibly diverse multicultural, you know, the main girl is wearing a hijab and she's playing a flute and there's mm -hmm. students with Black Lives Matter on and there's, you know, the trans flag. I mean, they just included so many. So you know that if you walked in there, that's the first thing you see, that will tell you who, you know, what kind of environment you're walking into. And so those little things like that, man, they make a big difference. Wow, yes. I absolutely agree. Um, I mean, it also provides a sense that um, the, like the adults are like listening to their students. Um, even if, like you say, perhaps somebody from that, um, from those groups weren't in the actual school, maybe one of the students have family members or have friends in other schools. Um, and so now that, 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 they see the inclusion and that's just so it's such an impact such an impact and that's the world they're living in right if yes. students are in a space like that yes. that might be the school you go to that's likely not going to be the work environment you go to the college environment you go to and so that's that's how we're preparing right these humans <laughs> to go out into the world they're not staying you know second graders forever and ninth graders forever and so um yeah, my, my dear friend, Teresa, who worked with me in Wake County always says, you know, if there were no students, none of us would have a job. <laughs> She's always reminding us, right? How many decisions and how many things do we do all the time without ever asking kids about it? And that's what I loved about that mural that I talk about in the book is that, you know, that was completely student driven. They came up with all those ideas. That was all of them. Um, how many times do we say, you know, we really need to talk about like black male achievement. You know, it's really suffering without ever having black males at the table to say what works for them in education and what doesn't work for them. It's like, we're making these decisions on assumptions, but let's pull in the people that are most proximate and close to the inequity and ask them. Um, I talk a little bit about that, like how we say, you know, we need to invite people to the table. Well, the idea of inviting someone to the table means I still own the table, right? Like I'm still, I still am inviting you to my table, you know, come over right. here, right? But we have to, equity says, flip that, right? Where are you? Let me come to you. Let me go to the library in your neighborhood to have parent-teacher conferences because that makes sense for you, right? And so it's this flipping of ideas of I get to decide I have the table versus this is about you, right? It's de-centering self. And that's so hard, so hard in every way, right? Personal relationships and professional relationships, but it's not about us. It's about our students. It's about our staff. It's about the community. I like that. So make it a picnic. Don't You don't have to come to my table. Let, let, I will go to you. That's so perfect. Yeah. Well, I think that we often say, oh, well, we invite them to the table, but the power dynamic there means, right? We are, you know, we, you know, whoever that is, the district, the administration, the teachers are the owners of the table and we invite you to come and then we ask you to leave, right? That's not an authentic, you know, connection and not, um, not beneficial, right? In that way, because we invite people who are being harmed by the system in and then we say, okay, thanks for your time. Bye. Do we, are, you know, what is that? How does that look, you know? So yeah. So shout out to systems like, you know, the like parent teacher home visits and um, open systems, you know, that are doing this work to be able to eliminate kind of that barrier in that space. Um, yeah, it's the most powerful thing that you can do as an educator is think about not me, right? Someone else. This is about that's the work that we do. Right. So like you mentioned, this book does have a real life scenario. Um, so there was one of education leadership using content from this book in their leadership practice, such as the principal who um, was brand new to a school and then found that the equity heat uh, map, as it's called, was useful, um, particularly in, the, in that section of the book. It talks about how equity is not equality. How, um, how, what does that refer to? So I worked um, with uh, an incredible educator principal, um, I should say her name, Sherry, and she um, she was um, had worked at the district office a long time and then had gone back to, um, and she was a principal, and you know, kind of showing her this framework and talking with new principals, and she was like, I think 
let me think about this. Let me think about the different ways this can work out. And her um, school office manager, like the data manager, a new student had come in and she worked at a predominantly white school with a very small um, population of students of color. And the new student came in and they said, oh, well, we have you know, 25 kids in each class. So we'll put them in this class. So to make them equal, right? So that there's the same number of kids in each class. And thinking about this system, she said, but I'm not sure that's the equitable thing to do because we have such a small group of students of color that then we have them all separated and they're not able to interact or be with each other. And there's a huge body of research about race, racial isolation for students and what that looks like in schools. Mm -hmm. And so by applying that lens to it, she said, actually, give me the breakdown of each classroom. And she looked at the breakdown. And yes, that meant that there were more students by two in one classroom, but it also meant that students of color were able to not be isolated on their own. And so the process of doing that for her was exactly what I'm talking about. This, these things that we do that are like, oh, it's always been done that way. Just put them in the classroom. That is, you know, has the least kids. That's how it's approached. And that's equal. But equity says then each student of color, and there was only four in the whole grade, all were isolated rather than being able to be in either groups of two or, you know, or all together. And so that that type of thinking is how we approach equity system structure. That's a shift. That's not let's create a team to talk about how we, you know, distribute kids and let's, you know, like have extra PD about how we do this. It's like, oh, this is our system. How can I shift it? No, put that student here. This makes sense. You know, an explanation with the teachers. And she was like, that's that. Okay. That's what I'll always do from now on. And so um, that was a brilliant example. And I just adore those small little shifts and changes that don't seem like a big deal, but ooh, that makes a really big difference for those students who are in those classrooms, right? Yeah, it's huge. It's it's one of those things that you never want to be called in class, but then you also don't want to be the one example in that class um, to where nobody else could really speak to that, uh, whatever question is addressed to you. But if there's two of you or three of you, maybe the one person who's more outspoken will raise their hand and maybe talk about it. Um, so yeah, that's so interesting. Yeah. And there's, like I said, there's, there's a large body of research, you know, talking about what racial isolation does for our students who are already marginalized in our education system. And so when we further isolate them in those spaces, they're not able, you know, these are large groups of our students of color are coming from communalistic um, cultures and backgrounds and families and to suddenly be alone and in a space where it's not serving them is um, truly detrimental to, you know, um, their academic achievement. And so, and they're just their whole lives. <laughs> and so when we shift and change that, yeah, as I was really, I loved that example because it was just a quick thing. And she's like, oh, I just have my dad at manager. Anytime a new kid show up, we just have a quick conversation and we, you know, keep it pushing. It didn't have to be this groundbreaking hours and hours worth of anything. It was just like, oh, this makes sense. Right. So when there are, uh, when you do your consulting and there are schools that tell you or that's so great that they do have these groups, that they do have these tax, task forces, um, what is the one thing that you do tell them not to do or to maybe like pull back from? Uh, oh, there's so many. <laughs> <laughs> I think that, um, you know, I – one of my big things that I feel very strongly about is um, how we are celebrating and what cultures we hold up when we are celebrating, um, whether that be holidays or observances or staff things and whatnot. I feel very, very strongly about this idea of kind of, you know, of what is cultural appreciation versus appropriation, because those little things that we do um, when we decorate, you know, if we're only decorating for Christmas time, what message are we sending, right? If we're, um, you know, doing Easter and Valentine's Day, right? Like if we kind of like stick to these kind of like um, white, you know, American centric ideas about what we celebrate and do, then we don't give service or homage to the multitude of cultures that are coming into our schools. And so, you know, I get Christmas around the world, but more importantly, you know, what do holidays look like all over? What do celebrations look like over? This is why I 
you know, feel very strongly we shouldn't be doing luau's for staff things, right? That's not our culture. We can't do that, right? Or, or you understand like Cinco de Mayo. Cinco de Mayo is not a thing, I right? <laughs> Can we get rid of the sombreros and mariachis? Like it's not even a thing. And so, you know, mm-hmm. Taco Tuesday. And those are the type of things that I see a lot of well-intentioned cultural or social groups or, you know, equity group. Oh, we're going to do a thing for this. And I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. Because <laughs> that's how we end up on front pages of newspapers, right? Because someone mm-hmm. is making a decision without people from that culture present or trying to do it in a way that is appreciative and ended up being appropriation. And so um, I included my tweet, you know, tweets that I've done in the book because I, you know, talked about, you know, how kids were wearing pilgrim um, hats and feathers and whatnot still in schools. And I was like, how are we still doing this? This is like so problematic. And I think that those are the things that I feel very passionate about when I'm spending time with committees. Like, let's talk very intricately about how we do this in a way that is um, life-giving and is a way that it's culturally appropriate in a way that is honoring who comes here and not making fun of or costuming about people who are living and who have been oppressed by the system for so long. I just feel so, so, so strongly about it. And I've seen it done in so many incredible ways. So I know that it can be done. Um, We just have to be very intentional about it. And that also speaks to how um, the students see it, though, because if you if you notice, social media does a lot of like they they uh, celebrated um, the New Year's for the Asian culture in all over social media. So these students are seeing that in if they don't see that um, as a celebration in their environment within the school, um, it just doesn't match up to their reality. Example too, right? Like that is a lot of people still call that Chinese New Year, right? There are over, I think a dozen, 20 cultures that celebrate Lunar New Year. So even the Mm -hmm. language that we're using when we talk Mm -hmm. about that is like, this is just isn't about China. This isn't about this, right? This is Lunar New Year. This is how millions, billions maybe of people are celebrating New Year across the world, right? And and surely in our in our culture and our classrooms too. So, and if not, I think that's a pushback I get. Well, we don't have any Asian cultures in our classroom. I'm like, even more reason to expose them to it, right? Because then they are seeing that there is more outside of them. And so um, yeah, even that shift of Chinese New Year versus Lunar New Year or Cinco de Mayo is not a thing. Let's let's let it go, you know, unless it's been, you know, co-opted. I was thinking like in L.A. culture, right? There's like low riders and different things that happen, yeah. like you know, but it's it's um, it's this idea that like I know how to celebrate your holiday better than you know how to celebrate your holiday. And like Thanksgiving just can't be the thing anymore for, right. you know, doing this pilgrim and, and, and feather thing. It's just really so very problematic in so many ways. So I think um, that is definitely the thing I, I think I'll die on a mountain about because I just, <laughs> it's I just, important. You know, it, it is important. Really it's, important. it's so important. I don't want my culture made into a costume or made fun of, and nobody does. Nobody deserves that. And it's important how like we we say things like you said um, to our students too, and, and to teach them how to how to talk and how to act when they become adults and go into college age and then become an actual an adult in the world, functioning an adult. And like you said, uh, we we aspire that our students um, work internationally, work you know work nationwide, work internationally, and also that comes with providing them with the knowledge of decorum of like respecting others religion um and then culture as well so alongside with everything that you're teaching them as school in the school um i think that um unfortunately fortunately teachers are kind of they shouldn't be responsible but they're responsible adjacent because they are the who our students are spending the most time with to wear whatever the school the teacher or education leader, the way that they talk, what the the way that they express themselves, the students pick up on that and sometimes adopt that way of talking and thinking. 
Absolutely. So, yes. No, and teachers, I mean, it's a, it's a very powerful position to be somebody's teacher. And it's a, it's a place of honor and privilege to be able to teach. And so um, absolutely, we have to do so in the most respectful, kind, inclusive way that we can, because that's what we would expect for ourselves. That's what we expect for our own children. And so, mm-hmm. you know, these are other people's children who are in our classroom, and we have to be able to do that as such. And um, you know, there's this common misconception, like, oh, no, they're too young and we don't have to talk about it. And that's a lot of the pushback I got when I was talking about, you know, how we can't be, you know, kind of co-opting Native Indigenous culture during November. And I say, you know, we shouldn't teach them the atrocities of me. I'm like, I'm not talking about, you know, telling kindergartners about the trail of tears, but I am <laughs> saying that we don't need to teach them lies, right? We just need to be able to say like, what are ways that we can be grateful? What are ways that you celebrate? You know, there are so many ways to do that without, it's not an either or, right? It's it's let's, you know, honor an entire culture and also, you know, teach kids the truth at the same time. They don't have to necessarily be two separate things. My son is in first grade. You know, I can have very, you know, first grade appropriate conversations with him without teaching him about, you know, massacres and, you know, different things. Kids understand way more than we give them credit for. Schools and districts do. um, It might be in different stages of their journey towards um, solid equity. So what advice as far as consistency um, for education leaders and teachers, how can they implement um, to make equity a natural expected part of education? Ooh. I, I believe strongly that the environment in which we place our students um, says so much. And I think that if we are not able to get together the task force and the structural changes and the ability to kind of, you know, have these conversations at high level consistently, that we can do so much just through very little um, strategic things. And I think about the schools that I go into that say everyone is welcome here, or they have diverse um, people and texts and things around, even things like that matter so much to students, especially in a world where books are being banned and legislation is being passed against their very humanity. I think that the inclusion of things like that matters so much. Um, So I, I would say, you know, for the teacher who is maybe, you know, kind of like on your own trying to do this work, what are the ways in which you are creating a space and a um, place for students to be their full authentic selves, even if the entire school environment is not there yet. And I think for leaders, just like my friend Sherry, right, in Wake County, what are, what are, what is something small that you can start with that you can shift and change. What is something that um, is going to have a large, you know, um, will have a large impact, but isn't a heavy lift. And so when we think about the kind of four quadrants that are like in my, in my book is that I, I tell leaders that are struggling, pick something small from each area. Cause it will then make, it will then not only feel like you are doing more than just a team, it is going to be more than just a team. So Let's say you pick something small from learning, something small from the environment, something small from a system and like a small, you know, something from a team and you kind of work on small little areas. Well, already you're not just focused on one area, you're in multiple spaces. So it's like, even if you have to just pick something small that you yourself can handle, because bless administrators, bless teachers, it's so hard. All of it's so difficult. You don't want to take on more, um, but we know that we need to do something different. And so think about your environment and the space that you included. I think about, um, you know, students naturally gravitate to classes and spaces where they know they are welcome. They feel included. I think about the classrooms that I hung out with when I was a teacher, you know, or when I was a student and a teacher, right? I'd be like, I want to go hang out with that professor. I want to go hang out in that class, you know, with that teacher because they were cool or they really liked us or they, we felt like we could be ourselves there. So if you're, especially in an environment that doesn't feel very equitable or inclusive as an educator, What are the ways in which you're making sure that your students feel um, included in that way? Because that matters a lot and could, you know, literally save lives and save students. Um, So I'm a big believer in just creating space wherever we can and then start small. But starting small is better than not starting at all. 
and we're all in different places. We have to give grace. You know, we always say meet students where they are. We have to meet adults where they are too, right? Our staff might not be where we want them to be, but we gotta meet them where they are, just like we do with our students. And I think over time, you know, we realize once you realize it's a journey, there's always going to be more to do. It doesn't become this rush. It's let's make it better, better, little by little by little. Um, but let's make it better. Let's not go backwards. Let's not let not address it. Let's actually keep, you know, trying to make it better. And that's the very beginning of my book. I do that quote from Aaron Dottie Roy. And it's like, how do we reimagine this world? Like I'm ready to fight with it. Right. I'm ready for educators to fight for it. And how do we rise up and say, this is, we have to do better. We have to do more. Lauren, thank you for such a captivating conversation about this. And then also your profound observations and insight to making equity a norm in schools, classrooms, um, and districts overall. It's certainly a journey as we did discuss, but it's a journey where this book can guide uh, towards implementing actions. So we appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. This book is without a doubt another tool for your toolbox with teaching. It's certainly an encouraging book as evident equity seeks equitable education for all. And it also shows how leaders can spearhead that movement. This book is available on the Solution Tree website, solutiontree.com. Look for Evident Equity by Lauren Mascareñas. We have a sponsor message here from the company. At Solution Tree, we share your vision to transform education to ensure learning for all. And we can help you make this vision a reality. No other professional learning company provides our unique blend of research-based, results-driven services that improve learning outcomes for students. We appreciate you tuning in. Make sure to navigate to our solution tree.com slash podcast page to listen to our other episodes. There you can subscribe to our podcast today via the subscribe drop down button to your favorite podcast app. Also remember to like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. This has been your host, Prisma Lopez Marine. Thank you for joining me for charting new paths in pre-K to 12 education.